Hello everyone, so this is an introduction to firewalls, thou shall not pass. We're going to be talking today about IP tables, firewall D, and PF. Without further ado, here we go. So coming up, what is a firewall and how do I secure it? And then we're going to look at three commonly used open source firewalls. We're going to be looking at IP tables, firewall D, and PF. And then we're going to look at some sample configurations. Now something why I want to point out is that we're going to be looking at basically the same but not exactly the same configuration for each firewall. Um, each one has different features that are unique to it and we'll, I'll do my best to try and explain why you would want to use one over the others. So without further ado, let's begin. So what is a firewall and how do I secure it? Firewalls are basically a set of rules that control traffic in and out of your computer. Um, so you use these rules to block certain types of traffic that you don't want and to allow specific traffic that you do want. Um, so there's basically two ways that you can go about this, a default accept policy or a default reject policy. So with a default reject policy, you have to whitelist specific traffic in order to come into the machine. With a default accept policy, you allow all traffic in except for the traffic that you explicitly block. Um, so what you want to do is open up the minimum number of ports in order to allow your communication. For example, if you have physical access to a box, and that's the primary way you're going to be accessing it, and you're never going to use SSH, block it. Um, if you're not using IPv6 on your network and none of your other machines are configured to use it, go ahead and block it. It's just another attack vector that someone could potentially use to get into your system. Um, specifically, um, in certain versions of PF, and I imagine other applications are affected by this too, um, differences in how the traffic is routed internally through the PF application allowed for people sending specific packet combinations to get arbitrary control into the memory on certain BSD machines. The vulnerability has largely been patched, but these kind of vulnerabilities exist because of the fact that IPv6 is significantly less prevalent than IPv4. And finally, one thing that you want to do is you want to make sure to log unusual traffic. And we're going to talk about how to do each of these three things today. So first off, let's begin with examining how each of these firewalls are different. So IP tables is the legacy firewall for Linux. It's on basically every Linux machine that you will possibly ever encounter. And it works by interacting with the NetFilter kernel module for the Linux kernel. It's very simple and very powerful. It uses a set of flags, we'll look at those in a moment, that allow you to control the traffic in a fairly, fairly concise manner. Um, you use these concept of chains. So there are three default chains, the input chain, the output chain, and the forwarding chain. These control traffic going into your computer, out of your computer, or through your computer, respectively and basically you add rules to these chains depending on what exactly you are trying to do with the traffic that you encounter. So when do I use this? Um, you want to use this on Linux um, or whenever you need very fine control of the firewall. It gives you the ability to filter out for example certain TCP flags being set on the traffic. You could say block traffic that has the third bit set to one. It gives you a very fine, precise level of control. Some important files to know about. On Red Hat systems, you're going to find the IP tables rules are in Etsy sysconfig IP tables. On other systems, such as Debian-based systems, they may be in Etsy IP tables. Um, these will contain a list of rules, which we'll look at in a moment, that describe exactly what traffic you will or will not allow onto your network. Next we have Etsy services. Etsy services is a list of ports and what applications run on those ports. What this file will let you do is specify for example that you want to use the destination port of SSH instead of necessarily saying that you want to use TCP port 22. It's a little bit easier syntax and can drastically improve the readability of your IP tables rule configurations. Now let's look at some important commands that you're going to need to know to use the IP tables. 
command effectively. First is IP tables. This is the base command that you're going to be using to modify the firewall um, in different flags thereof. Other commands to be aware of would be service IP tables, which could be either passed start, stop, or status. This allows you to start or stop or get the status of the IP table service, which is the basically loads the kernel module net filter into place and sets up the default routing rules. Um, on newer Linux systems you will use that use systemd, you might also use the systemcdl command to accomplish the same effect. The two other commands that I will show you here are IP table save and restore. What these two commands let you do are save the running configuration into a special format that IP tables knows how to read in very quickly. So it can read in a list of commands and then execute them all very quickly. It's not necessarily a format that you want to be editing, which is what we'll kind of look at a little bit later, but in terms of quickly writing out a list, long list of rules and quickly reapplying them, IP tables save and restore was what will let you do that. Next would be firewall D. Firewall D is part of the system D project not directly but is generally strongly affiliated with it and you will almost never see it on a system that is not running systemd. It use, use, provides an ease of use layer on top of IP tables written in Python. Um, it puts a focus onto what are called zones and services. We'll take a look at these in a moment but what a zone is is it's basically a collection of services and ports that you want to make available on a certain segment of your network. For example, if you have a NIC that is facing the external internet, you may call that node, that zone public and you have an internal zone where you have traffic going amongst your servers. These different zones of traffic will have different services. For example, you may allow SSH traffic from your internal network, but you don't want to necessarily allow it from your external network. In this case, you would have the SSH service in the public, in the internal zone, but not the public zone. It also gives you controls over what applications may change the firewall. As far as I'm aware, this is really specialized to firewall D, and will let you specify what programs can change the firewall and when they can change them. Where you want to use firewall D, I would recommend you using firewall D wherever you want to be able to quickly specify firewall syntax for your computer. But you don't have a super complicated configuration because the commands for more complicated configurations end up being just as long as the existing ones would be for IP tables if not longer. So some important files that you want to be aware of are userlib firewall d and etsy firewall d. Under these two directories are a collection of directories which contain files that describe the zones and services and other items and objects that the firewall D service will interact with. So userlib firewall D are where the default definitions of services go. For example, you might have a userlib firewall D services SSH that defines that SSH is traffic coming in under port 22. Now suppose on your machine you have instead remapped SSH to come in on port 10. In that case, you would create a file under Etsy firewall D services SSH.xml, which would instead say the default port is 10. So what that will allow you to do is without modifying the default configuration of SSH, quickly remap the open port for that service in place. Also, some important commands. Firewall command is the primary command used to modify the firewall under firewall D. And as I said before, you're probably not going to encounter this without systemd. So you're always always going to start it with systemcdl start stop or status firewall D, which will load the appropriate kernel modules and default configurations. So the last one that I'm going to talk about is PF, which is the standard firewall for BSD. It is much more suited to being used as a router. Um, it has better forwarding tools and NAT translation tools than from what I'm familiar with are available under IP tables or firewall D. Um, another big change between PF and IP tables slash firewall D is the concept of the last rule in the list wins. So that means 
what would you would want to do is if you wanted to accept a given piece of traffic in IP tables, you would have a rule earlier in the list that would say allow this traffic in. Whereas in PF, you would want to have a default deny first, and then you would later have a line that would allow in a specific piece of traffic. Um, also, we'll get to this in a moment. You want this is a BSD machine, and I would recommend using it whenever you have a BSD device that you can use as your router. It has a lot of power and is really good at solving this job. Some important files that we want to talk about here are etsyrc.conf, which if you're not familiar with BSD is where most of the system configuration materials currently lie until they um, import something to the effect of LaunchD, uh, which is what they're currently looking at doing. But for the time being, etsyrc.conf is where most of your system-wide configuration goes. And then etcpf.conf is where the firewall configuration itself goes. So, how do I modify the firewall? You use the command pfcdl-f followed by a file name in order to load a configuration. Note, this is the only way that you can actually load a firewall configuration. Unlike firewall D or IP tables, there is no way to change the running config except to load a config file. You cannot modify commands one at a time. Furthermore, um, some commands that you may need to use are pfcdl-sa to see what traffic has gone in under which networks and so on and so forth. And also the kd load pf, which is the bsd command to load the kernel module associated with the pf firewall. So let's take a look at some example firewalls, beginning with IP tables. This is how you would, for example, set up the basic IP tables firewall. So just to begin, the first command, iptables-f, will flush the firewall. This means it removes all of the rules on the firewall. Next, iptables-x will delete all non-default chains that are empty. And since we just removed all of the firewall rules from the tables, this should delete everything except for the default input, output, and forward chains. Next, we're going to allow traffic that is coming in on the loopback interface. We designate this by saying append to the input chain any traffic matching the interface of the local loopback, and we're going to accept it. The next line is sort of a hack that will let you figure out what the default route is. So this will this particular command will go out and find what the externally facing interface is and then set that IP address to current device. You'll notice that I've defined an environmental variable here. This is a bash script, of course. Um, it contains all of the RFC addresses which are supposed to be non-routable on the external network. Um, we're going to be using this later in our script. Uh, so what you want to do is deny some, put in a default deny policy, use, use this with the IP tables P which is policy. Um, we're setting input the input chain policy to drop. You can also set the other chains also to drop, we'll look at that with IPv6 in just a moment. But at this point we're just denying all traffic by default. This is how we would block IPv6 traffic, traffic, setting the default input, output, and forwarding policies to drop. This will ignore the traffic. Notice that IP6 uses the IP6 tables commands just as you would use IP6 tables save and IP6 tables restore. So here we're going to set up some logging information whenever we block packets. So to do this we've defined a new table called log drop which we are going to used to track our block traffic. We're doing this by creating a log drop table. We're then importing the log module and saying log at log level info beginning with the prefix IP tables any packets that come in at more than five a minute or more than ten packets 
and then we're going to log that traffic. Now where does this traffic go? It's going to go wherever your kernel log is. That means if you're using journal D, it's going to, be going to end up in your journal D logs. If you're using sys log, it will show up in probably var log messages or whatever other logging system you have according to your syslog configuration. Finally, we're going to append to log drop a dash j drop. So after we have logged the traffic, we will drop the traffic. This is the only log is the only IP tables target which does not automatically stop processing. So, moving on. The next command that we're going to use is to drop bad packets. So what we're saying is we're going to on any packets coming in, we are going to look at their connection status history, so in other words using a stateful firewall. And for any packet that has an invalid state flag, we're going to send it to the log drop table, which we just created. We're also going to take any raw packets and that fail the RP filter test and send them to log drop. Next, for all of the unroutable addresses on our external interface that are TCP traffic heading to either HTTP, which is port 80, to find in Etsy services, or SSH, we are going to reject those traffics. So by using the for loop here, we loop over all of the possible external addresses. Next, we're going to add some exceptions for our applications. The first line that you see here is what creates the basis of a stateful firewall. So we're going to allow established and related traffic that we have, so that whenever a packet comes in, it will search the packet database and see whether or not these packets have state or are related to existing connection which has state. Next, we're going to log SSH connections. We're going to allow SSH connections coming in on TCP as long as they don't exceed 10 connections or more than 5 a minute. This will protect us from people trying to, for example, brute force an SSH connection or open up too many SSH connections to us. And then finally, we're going to restore the default input policy by dropping any additional packets. Firewall D comes in and greatly simplifies the matter, but let's look at a zone and a service file example. So very seldomly will you directly edit a zone file. This example is provided only just as a means to understand exactly what's going on under the hood. So in the public.xml file in user lib zones public, you may find a file that looks similar to this. So in this particular configuration, we have a zone called public, which we are describing as being our external interface. It handles all traffic coming in on the interface ENP0S3 and will allow by default any HTTPS traffic or traffic coming in from the 10 subnet and will block any traffic coming in on the 10 subnet that exceeds more than five connections a minute and drop it. Likewise, you can have service files Service files contained a short description, a short name, a collection of ports that can be either TCP or UDP, and some services will also contain a module, such as the FTP module. These modules help track certain protocols like FTP, which use random high numbered ephemeral ports, which are very hard to track even in a stateful firewall. Using the kernel modules, however, you can simplify this problem by logging the connections as they're created. The Not all services will have kernel modules, but for those that do, you can install them and then note the kernel module by this module tag as shown. So let's look at how we can replicate the configuration that we previously made with IP tables. So the bulk of the configuration that we did where we blocked invalid addresses is already put in place by the firewall D protocol or program. So what we've done is we've created a zone called public and added the external interface to it. Then for all of the unroutable public addresses, 
we've added a rule where we're going to log and then drop all traffic coming into our device. Additionally, we're going to add SSH as a publicly accessible service and then we are going to allow HTTPS service. Now, as a point of comparison between the dash dash permanent version of the command and the version without, we'll automatically set the SSH service to be added to the permanent firewall configuration. Whereas without permanent, this will only be added to the temporary version of the firewall configuration. If you look at, for example, at the last command, the dash dash runtime to permanent, all versions of firewall D after a certain version, I believe it's 208, will feature this command. This will allow you to filter out and valid, or this will allow you to save the current running configuration so that you don't have to necessarily duplicate all of the commands that you've previously entered. Now let's go on to PF. So this is adapted from the BSD Now tutorial. BSD Now is a podcast put on, part of the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. They do a really good job and they cover a lot of different BSD related topics. I really suggest that you check out their work as well as the other podcasts from the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. So, first we define an external interface, EM0, and they've listed out this is in the pf.com, a variable called broken, which will contain all of the addresses that are non-routable on a public network. Next, they set the default block policy to drop, and then they skip all traffic that is coming in on the local loopback interface. Next, they're going to match all traffic that is coming in, and for traffic that does not pass the no DF and max MMS of 1440 will be scrubbed. This helps eliminate packets with invalid flags. Next, we're going to set our default deny policy of blocking all traffic. Now, I mentioned earlier that normally in PF, whenever a command is matched, it's only the last match that will actually win. This is the exception when you use the quick command. Pass out quick on the external interface, keep state says that we're going to automatically allow out of our computer any traffic leaving on the external interface and keep state. So when we allow traffic to leave our device, we open the necessary ports to allow the traffic back in. Anti-spoof anti -spoof will perform certain checks to verify that packets don't have spoofed IP addresses or other spoofed flags. This can help protect you from some forms of invalid packets. This is how you block IPv6 on BSD, it's PF, and here is how you block packets that have come in but are not routable to return. This is a common sign of a spoofed IP address and can be used to help protect your system. Next, we're going to block out any address that goes to one of those Martian addresses that we talked about earlier, the non-routable public addresses. Val this will help protect us from routing traffic to invalid locations. Next, we want to address people that are behaving poorly on our network. So to do this, we're creating two tables. These tables are basically lists of addresses that will help protect us from traffic. The table children's will be used to block any misbehaving actors on our network. We'll go more on that in a second. Secondly, they're defining a file that will allow you to protect, prevent all traffic from Chinese addresses, come, known Chinese addresses from coming on your server. This is defined in the cn.zone file that you can probably find, which you can probably download and find. So block in quick proto from show new to any port 80 or 22 will then block any traffic from China going to either our web server or to SSH. This is how we allow in traffic for our, our applications. So what we're doing here is we're allowing traffic in from any port to port 80 on our 
computer that passes a send send ack and keep the state on that connection. This will allow people to connect to our web server. Next, we're allowing traffic from the address 1234 to access an assortment of ports in order to perform some necessary, presumably maintenance work. The next command will allow traffic that from SSH, provided that we have no more than five connections from a given source, and that we have no more than five connections every five minutes, and that any traffic that fails this limit test will be added to the children's table. This can then be flushed by a command based off of the pfcdl command. Lastly, we're going to allow the IMPC echo request. This is what you will probably know as a ping. This will allow people to find our server and then test it for connections, as is appropriate according to the RFCs. So in summary, know your network. Use a firewall to secure your devices, and open source firewalls are, can be powerful and easy to use. Here are the sources that I pulled most of this information from. Check them out. They're pretty useful. So if you have any questions, feel free to email us at acm.cs.clemson.edu. And this material is available on a, under a Creative Commons Sharealike 4.0 license. Thank you for your time. Have a good evening.